We want to talk about some common myths and misperceptions around the subject of um, snow effects and ice effects on roofs. And the first one goes like this. The use of snow retention devices causes ice dams. Has anyone heard this in the past? Usually in this field, you, you do get that some. Um, this is actually a myth. What, what, you like my, you like my sound effect? <laughs> That's a quack. Um, what causes ice dams? What causes ice dams are temperatures low on the roof, the low temperatures, sub-freezing temperatures down near the eave of the roof, and warmer temperatures upslope of those. Okay, and why would the temperatures be warmer upslope than downslope? Well, because of the thing we talked about a moment ago. Building heat escapes through the roof. So whatever degree of insulation is there, there is some heat passing through that insulation. The roof, remember, is insulated just by virtue of the blanket of snow that's there that acts as insulation. And so even though the outside temperature might be well below freezing, the roof is generally considerably above that ambient temperature, and it doesn't take a whole lot of heat loss through that roof assembly to warm the roof surface to above freezing. When it gets above freezing, it begins to uh, uh, melt the snowbank or, or layer of ice that's up there. And the melt water runs down slope. But when it gets outside the heated envelope of the building, now the roof temperature is more subject to that ambient temperature. And so that melt water refreezes. It's, pretty, it's a pretty simple concept. It's very common. It happens especially when you have long overhang dimensions. You know, now, depending upon the severity, depending upon that ambient temperature, you know, when that drops to minus 15, you can get icing down here even when there's a very minimal overhang, OK? But that's what causes eave icing. And often, I've seen ice dams of 18 inches in thickness or more. The more severe, the, the colder the ambient temperatures tend to be, the more prone to this phenomenon uh, the, the roof assembly is. And, and so the ice dam will begin to form. And then melt then that creates a little bit of a dam. Melt water comes down, and now it lingers there because it's dammed up. So it lingers there, and it has a lot more time to freeze rather than running off the roof. And so it's kind of a cancerous sort of thing. You know, it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And I've seen ice dams build up to 18 inches or more in, in thickness. I've heard of ice dams that are several feet uh, deep. And then obviously, behind that ice dam, as this graphic kind of depicts, you have an area of, of meltwater that's transitioning from liquid to solid. And that's why it just keeps building in depth and thickness. That's what causes ice dams. So where are the snow guards? in that process? Nowhere is the answer. I mean, they're, they're not involved in that process. Now, granted that if you have snow guards, it retains the snow on the roof for longer periods of time. OK, so it, it may exacerbate this problem just because the snow can't slide off the roof now. But keep in mind, that an ice dam, when it begins to form, is of itself a snow guard. It's an unintentional one, but it's sometimes a very effective one. So with or without snow guards, if you have a roof that's prone to eave icing, 
A snow guard is not going to make that really better or worse. It, it one has little, if any, effect on the other. And that's the science of ice dams. Um, here you see a, a really great example of that. It's not a metal roof, but um, you, you can, any time, by the way, you see icicles, you have that potential going on. Now, a lot of times, it, it never gets too bad uh, because the eave overhang is minimal. But as, seen, as soon as you see an eave with icicles, you, you know that you're in that boat. You know, you have an eave that's prone to icing. And so here you see what's going on at these cold overhangs. You see that the snow has never melted because the roof temperature is the same here as it is here. But inside the heated building envelope, you can see what I explained is going on. Notice also in this slide the porch area here, which is not heated. OK, so there's no, this is not a, a, a heated space down here. So the roof is a constant temperature from, from eave to ridge. It's the same temperature. It's, it's an open porch. And you have outside air circulating. Uh, this one is in, in, a, in a ski resort out to the, to the uh, west of, of Denver. And you see this, this job, by the way, has no snow retention on it. But the ice dam is a rather effective snow guard. Unintentional, but rather effective. So what can you do about eave icing? Stop the heat loss. <laughs> Try, try to make the roof the same temperature upslope as it is downslope. So one way to do that is, is reduce the heat loss from the building envelope through the roof by adding insulation. So put more insulation in the attic, reduce that heat loss. Point two, increase the attic ventilation. So if you have an attic space, make sure you're introducing cold air to, to vent out and exhaust you know, when the warm air migrates through the attic floor, vent it out of there. So now keep the attic at a closer temperature to the outside temperature, and you'll reduce the tendency for uh, roof icing. Super insulate. Sometimes you don't have an attic. You have a cathedral ceiling, so you don't have an attic floor. In a case like that, you really have to super insulate the, 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 uh, the, the roof assembly. I live in such a, 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 a design, by the way. You know, I'm, and my house are all cathedral ceilings, but they're super insulated. I have no, no eave icing problems. Of course, that's something that you have to do at the time of construction. These other things are retrofit kind of ideas, but this one you have to do by building design. And if you're already stuck, <laughs> Then you got to do something else. Uh, and this one is also by roof design is a cold, use a cold roof design. That's in essence, you have a, a deck assembly that, that's insulated. You really kind of have a roof over a roof is that concept. So you, so you have one deck assembly, then an airspace that's ventilated, and then another roof on top of that airspace. It's a very expensive way to build, so it seldom gets done. And, and the, the, the last resort is the one that's actually the most common, um, is to use self-regulating heat tracing. Now, we're not talking here about heat tape, that you go to Home Depot and, 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 and buy a heat tape to wrap around a, a plumbing pipe. You know, we're talking about a more sophisticated product here. That, that's self-regulating. It comes on, it's temperature sensitive, and it comes on when the temperature is really cold, and, and then it shuts down. And that's what we're seeing here in, in both these photographs. And, and what, it's, what it's doing is it's providing a channel. It doesn't necessarily prevent e-vicing, but what it does is it provides a drainage channel 
so that that ice dam can never build up the way the way I described, because it's it's got channels through that ice that enable the water to drain, and so it doesn't build up. And just a side note, when you're using heating cables, snow guards are an absolute must. Because if you don't put snow guards on, the avalanche is going to wipe out the heating cable. <laughs> and oftentimes, you can use the snow retention as an anchor point on the upper end of, of that heating cable. So you would move the snow retention in a case like this. You would move it up slope a little bit and, and then use it as an anchor point and de-ice below the snow retention. This, by the way, is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is IBM's world headquarters. When you're using heat tracing, remember to run the heat trace uh, in the gutter, it didn't do any good to force liquefaction of an ice dam here and then have a gutter that's not de-iced. It's going to fill up. It's going to be a big iceberg. So remember to de-ice the gutter, too. And not only that, but remember to de-ice the downpipe. You've got to de-ice all the way to the ground or even below ground, it, you know, if it's draining below ground. You've got to get below frost line. Myth number two, using snow retention devices will lead to seam submersion and water infiltration of the roof system. Um, it, it's not to say that this can't happen, but it's not caused by using snow retention devices. It's caused by the very nature of, of an ice dam that, as I explained, dams up liquid water and now it submerses seams and, and so on. <laughs> And that's why in, in some alpine and mountainous climates, the local codes mandate the use of a peel and stick membrane down there because they, they know that ice dams are associated with seam submersion in some cases and, and leaking and flooding and so on. But once again, snow retention had nothing to do with that. Uh, number three. When using snow guard devices, they should be peppered all over the roof surface, not localized at the eave. Okay, earlier I told you there are two methods of snow retention, a continuous fence and individual cleats. And the guys who sell individual cleats are the ones generally who, who are propounding this story. Um, both methods can be effective, but it's wrong to say, well, it has to be one way or the other. They can, they can both work effectively. So like this is what they tell you. And they have a, there are a lot of reasons that they give you for this myth. And usually any good myth has a, at least a little basis in truth and fact. That's how, that's how they, you know, that's how they propagate. So what some of these guys will tell you is, well, you don't want to you don't want to retain snow just down here because then the loads are not distributed over. And at first hearing, that seems to make some sense. You, you want you want that load to be distributed over the surface of the roof. Uh, you don't want a concentrated load right here because that constitutes a point load. The roof is not designed for that, and, and, you're, and you're threatened by potential collapse because you point loaded the roof. I mean, at first hearing, that seems to make sense. But if you believe that, then you would have to believe that snow accumulates on a roof something like this. Uh, now, I'm not sure about Pennsylvania, but, but but where I'm from, snow accumulates on a roof more like this. And the only time that, that you really see what I described formerly in advanced stages of thaw, you may see this, you know, where 
that roof is clean and you just have this snow down here. And so people say, see, look, you're, it's point loading. Well, right, it's point loading now. But this is not design snow load. This is design snow load, OK? This is very advanced stages of thaw. And the loads here are pretty minimal. So myth debunked. But another reason they'll tell you why you got to have them distributed all over the roof is that if you don't, then snow will come sliding down this roof and crash into this, and it, the impact load will break it, and, and away it goes. Once again, at first glance, that may seem logical. But if you believe that, you'd have to believe that snow accumulates on a roof something like this. And then at some point, all of a sudden, without warning, it does that. Once again, I've never lived in Pennsylvania. Maybe it does that. But where I'm from, it accumulates more like that. So why does it make sense to interface with this bank of snow down here? That snow densifies over time. And it densifies from, compressed, from its own weight. It just gets more and more dense from its own weight. And it also gets more dense from those drag loads that are pushing it toward the eave end. Now, we're all familiar with densification properties of snow. We may not have thought it too scientific. But when you had the snowball fight with your little brother, or big brother, as the case may be, you're packing snow, right? And you start out with a fair hunk of it, and you compress it down until it gets pretty hard like a ball. That's snow densification, right? And so you take a large volume, you press it into a smaller volume, it becomes more dense. And what else? It gets harder. Well, when it gets harder, what that is, that is compressive strength. You're increasing the compress, and it gets so hard you can't pack it anymore, right? So it, what you're doing as it densifies, its compressive strength is increasing to a point where you just can't pack it any tighter. So what a snow guard does is it utilizes that property of the snow. It's compressing toward the roof surface. So where it is the densest and has the highest compressive strength is where it's right adjacent to the roof. In addition to that, it's compressing in this direction. So where is its compressive strength the greatest? Adjacent to the roof and toward the eave end because you have both those compressive forces working on it down there. So where does it make the most sense to interface with that bank of snow, where its compressive forces are the strongest? Right? Everybody with me? Down there. Not to say <coughs> that you can't distribute them upslope, but only to prove the point that you don't have to, that, that the most effective place is toward the eave end. Now, when you have a huge roof, OK, and you have multiple rows or multiple cleats or whatever, all right, then you want to distribute them a little more. But you still want to concentrate that distribution toward the lower end of the roof. And that's the science of it. So you will see throughout the world, I took this <coughs> photograph in Norway, where snow retention has been practiced for hundreds of years. And notice that although this job required three rows, where are they? They're not evenly spaced up the slope of the roof. I'm not saying that's a wrong thing to do. 
Some engineers, they want to see them evenly spaced because an engineered mind only thinks logically as a rule when they can apply math. And so they can determine the tributary areas and all this kind of stuff, and, and, and they're content doing that. If you can't prove it by math, an engineer really, you know, he's like, <laughs> and this can't be proven by math. This, this is more art than, than science. I mean, it's logical, but there's no math that you can put to it. Here another one, this, this one in, in uh, Stockholm, Sweden. And you see two rows, but they're both congested toward the eave. This one is in the uh, French Alps, or Austrian Alps, sorry. It's not a metal roof, it's a tile roof, but same thing with a cleat-type device, concentrated near the eave. And, you know, the argument that's sometimes used is, well, if you do it like this, then all the load from up here is concentrated on this one row. And it will precipitate a failure of that row, and then you'll have a progressive failure of the remaining rows. That's to the engineer's mind. I mean, that's how their mind usually works. But what that doesn't recognize is the whole phenomenon that I just explained. That blanket becomes very dense, and it becomes a monolithic slab. So it, it kind of distributes its own load, and it's shared between the, these devices. It seems the reason cleats work is the same thing. The snow bridges from one to the next to the next. It doesn't need a continuous thing in there because it's a monolithic slab, and it's able to bridge. So that one engages it, and then this one in the space in between, it's, it really doesn't matter. It just bridges from one to the other. So people don't have any trouble realizing, well, it'll bridge from here to here to here, but somehow it won't bridge from here to here? Well, of course it does. Myth number four, the deeper the snow, the taller the snow guard has to be. You've probably run into that. Well, it really snow. I mean, we get, you know, we get five feet. So we don't want this little, we got to have, you know, bar, we, we need three or four bar, you know, like a big fence. <coughs> Why is that science fiction? Because of what I've already explained. The, the, the densest snow is right here adjacent to the panel surface. That snow represents a monolithic slab, not only in this direction, but in this direction as well. It's sort of all glued together, where its compressive strength is the greatest, is down here close to the roof and near the eave end. So what we're doing with a snow guard down here is we're engaging that bank of snow where it has the greatest compressive strength. And, and that's totally logical. And, and it works. So we don't need a snow guard that's this high just because we have a very deep bank of snow. It's hard for people sometimes to, to wrap their brain around. Um, this is the most popular part today that I've found. This is a tile kind of roof that's popular in, in, in the Alps, in, in, in Austria, and in the German Alps, and so on. And this is where they get, they measure snow depth in meters. And six, eight, ten meters of snow is not unusual. You know, that's 20 or 30 feet of snow held in place by a device that's about an inch and a half tall. This is in the German Alps, in the Bavarian Alps, uh, south of Munich. I took these photos early in the season. There's only about a meter of snow on these roofs. By the end of the season, it'll be three or four meters. And this is the most popular system in the Bavarian Alps. It's a pipe that's about an inch and a quarter, holding several meters of snow on the roof. And these have been used successfully uh, uh, for a long time. 
80, 100 years or something. This is a color guard job. Our color guard is two inches. This is a bank of snow that's 31 inches. Um, I happened to be able to take this picture, but we have color guard installed at Mid Mountain Vale, where it, it will typically have 8, 10, even 12 feet of snowpack on the roof with the same two inch uh, snow guard. So it doesn't take a big snow guard to restrain a big depth of snow. But we got tired of fighting this fight with architects who just believe bigger is better. So we came up with an X guard system that you'll see if you haven't already. Um, is it better than color guard? Does it do a more effective job? No. <laughs> but for those who think bigger is better, it's big. Number five, the force of snow on the snow guard cannot be calculated. It must be determined by some sort of voodoo known only to the supplier of the snow guard. This is actually dangerous. When I invented S5 technology, I, my first market was snow retention applications. And I was kind of a neophyte a little bit, and I wanted to know, well, how, how, there has to be some way to quantify how, you know, because I went to the lab. I knew I figured out a really neat way to do this, you know, with the set screws and all this stuff. So I went to the lab just to see how strong that connection was. And, you know, I'm, it was like a couple thousand pounds. And I thought, wow, this baby's really strong. You know, this going to hang on there like country music. But how do I use that information? I mean, it's so strong. OK, so what? But how strong does it need to be? I called every snow guard manufacturer in the United States. And at that time, I had a consulting practice. And I was using some of their products. And I asked them, how do I design this thing for this given roof? Not a single, there were only five companies in business at that time. That was about 1992 or three. And I called every single one of them. I said, how do I figure this? How do I know how many of your parts I got to put on my roof here? Not a single one could tell me. I got answers like, we're not engineers. How many do you want? What color? <laughs> Those were the kind of answers I got. So there wasn't a single practitioner in the industry who was using any math or science to determine any of this. My next call was to my buddy, Tom Shingler, who at the time worked for AEP Span. He's an engineer. Uh, I'm not an engineer, by the way. And I asked Tom. And I called an engineering friend of mine at Armco Building Systems, who I knew quite well. And the, both those guys gave me the same answer. They explained it to me. There's some math and science involved <laughs> that I'm going to show to you. So coming back to this, if you're relying on a snow guard manufacturer to tell you, good luck. Because now that S5 has been around for a long time, some of our competitors have figured out, oh, well, there is something to this, really. <laughs> but still, some of the answers you get from some of those companies are still pretty goofy. And they may give you recommendations, but what are they based on? Because they understood some of it. You know, I've written articles about this, been published in trade journals and so on. And some of those guys have read some of that stuff. But most of them, it's gone right over their head. So I want to show you guys how easy it is to do. This diagram may be, look a little complicated, but bear with me for a minute. We talked before about this vertical force, which is just the weight of the snow on the roof, that translates into an angular or a vector force coming in this direction, parallel to the roof. Now, this force is not as great as this force, right? This angular force is some, but it has a direct relationship to this one. What is that relationship? It's going to be less, but it's going to be determined from that force. So the math is really very simple. 
you take this force, you multiply it by the sine of this roof angle. You immediately recognize that this force is going to get greater as the roof gets steeper, right? And by the time the roof is flat, this force is zero, right? There is no angular force when it's flat. But as it gets steeper, this force increases given that the same load is present, the vertical load, in either case. And I'm going to show you how that works. Vertical weight of the snow is reduced by the sign of this roof angle. See, as that roof gets steeper, this is going to be a, 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 a fractional number. The sign of this angle is going to be a fractional number. The, the sign of zero degrees is zero. The sign of 90 degrees is 1.0. So everything in between is a fractional number. So here you see, and by the way, you, you have some handouts in, in these folders. And you don't have to memorize all this stuff I'm telling you because a, a, most of it is in here, and this math is certainly in here. If you, if you go to page two and three here, you'll see this chart on the bottom left of page two. This is in the green one. It, this math is also in the other one, though, by the way. It's also in the, in the A to Z. And it gives you this chart. So this takes your, your slope in units, and it tells you how many degrees that is, and then it also tells you the sign of that. So notice that as the slope gets lower, a 112 is 0 0.08, and when you get up to a 1212, which is 45 degrees, right, it's up to 0 0.7. And you go steeper than that, it, it gets closer and closer to 1.0. Everybody see that? So let's go through an example. It, it's not too difficult to understand. Here's our roof. It's a 512. We look on that little table in there, and it's gonna, and we want to find the sign for a 512 roof, and we look it up and it's 0.38 and a bunch of other numbers. I just use the first two. That gets you close enough. So the sign is 0 0.382. Now we need to know the vertical roof snow. This is the design roof snow load. It is not the same as ground snow. It's not the same as ground snow. It can be determined from ground snow, but it's not necessarily the same as ground snow. So. 40 PSF just for purposes of this example, and we're trying to solve for this, because that's the force that our snow guard has to resist, right? So we take our 40 PSF times the sine of that roof angle, 382, and we get 15.28. What does that number represent? Well, this number is in PSF, right? So when we multiply by this, <coughs> Our answer is still in pounds per square foot, but now it's this force for every square foot of roof surface. So we got to do something else. We have to now calculate, we have to extend that figure for the tributary area. You understand the tributary area, if, if we put a clamp here and a clamp here, the tributary area to each clamp is what? It's the width of the panel and the length actually measured in, in plan. That's the tributary area in vector force to that unit, right? It's actually half of this panel and half of this panel, right? So we need to know the panel width. So let's assume for this example that the panel is 16 inches wide and that the run, the rafter length from eave to ridge is 50 feet. 
So 16 inches is, is 1.33 feet times 50 feet times the 15.28, and the resulting figure in this example is 1,016 pounds. What does that mean? That means at full design snow load on this roof, that clamp is going to experience that load, 1,016 pounds. And now our units are in pounds per panel. And that's the way we wanted them, because whether it's this snow guard or some other, we're always going to install so many per panel, right? So for this example, we got to resist 1,016 pounds for each roof panel. And now that we know that number, choose your snow guard. We now have a way to compare apples and oranges, right? And to determine the frequency of placement for the snow guard, divide the tested allowable load of the snow guard device proposed into the calculated force for one panel, the, the number we just calculated. The resulting figure is the number of parts required per panel. Now, there's one thing missing from that. Anybody? Thank you. Factor of safety. So notice that it's actually not missing, but I read over it quickly. This says tested allowable load, which is not the thing, not the same as the failure load. The failure load, when we test this device and we rip it off this seam or it migrates, we have a number of different modes of failure. But that failure load is its ultimate load. We don't want to use that in design. We want a factor of safety applied to that. And, and, and at S5, we use a factor of safety of 2.0. So the, the tested allowable load is going to be half of what this actually failed at. That's important, because there, there are a lot of vendors out there of other products that have no idea what allowable load even means. You know, they, it failed at thus, that's what they publish. You don't ever want that thing to get to failure under design loads. That's why we use factors of safety. So here we go. Option one. A unitized device with a published allowable load of 270 pounds. Remember, we needed 1,016. Divide by 270, so we need 3.76 parts per panel. Obviously, you can't do that, so you round up to four. And, and there we are. Option two, a fence-type device. It might be called S5 color guard <laughs> with a published allowable of 1,050 pounds. Our ask load is lower than our tested allowable load. Therefore, only one row is required. If the manufacturer can't tell you the tested load to failure value for his product, I wouldn't buy it. I mean, there are a lot of untested products out there on the marketplace. I, for me, that you're disqualified. If you, if you haven't done this testing, then how do I do the math to know how many of your parts I should use on my roof? You, you can't do it. You have nowhere to go. OK, snow retention systems all have about the same holding strength. <laughs> That's a big quack. You saw these slides earlier. Number seven, this is myth number seven. The use of snow guards will increase the drag loads on the roof panel. It'll increase those vector loads, and it'll rip them off the structure. That's also science fiction. If you go. Um, if you go once again in that, in that green book, it talks about panel pinning, okay? 
it talks about how to pin the panel. And you actually do the very same calculations that you just, the, the same forces that are trying to rip the snow guard off the roof are also trying to drag the panel off the roof from its point of fixity. So now on a steep roof like this, we're going to fix that panel up here. And those calculations should be done to pin this panel, because the it's the same forces. Remember, codes don't normally assume that snow is going to evacuate the roof. They assume that the full, what's called P sub F, is pounds per squ square foot for a flat roof. Um, and, and that is the number that's normally assumed in, in structural design. So they don't assume that snow is going to slide off the roof. Now, here you see the result of panels that were inadequately pinned to the structure. It, it's, it's ripping them right off the roof. Notice, show me the snow guards that caused this. They're not there. This roof had no snow guards on it. But the panels were inadequately pinned to the structure to resist those vector forces that are trying to rip them off, whether there's snow guards there or not. Thank you.